We are at Blunting the Fisher's Spear in South Seas CDF with Arun Vishnawat. Uh, Arun is an associate professor at the University of Buffalo, and this is his very first black hat talk. So before we begin, I have a few brief announcements. Uh, we encourage you to stop at the business hall downstairs in Bayside AB. Uh, Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on this level in level three, and the Arsenal reception is at seven or sorry at five o'clock, seventeen hundred for those of you who would use twenty-four hour time. If you have not picked up your merchandise, today is your last chance to do so. You need to pick up the Black Hat swag, and the bookstore is also closing today. And make sure you visit the Kali Linux lab in Mandalay Bay A, because they're doing a lot of interesting stuff over there. Also, I'm going to thank you in advance for putting your phone on vibrate and or do not disturb mode. Because nobody wants to hear your phone ringing as you wait for it to go to voicemail. Thank you. Uh, Arun Vishnawat. Thank you. So folks, uh, I'm super excited to be here um, and thank you for that introduction and uh, thank you for, for showing up for this talk. Uh, I know it's dealing with, uh, uh, with human factors. You know, just to give you a little bit of background about who I am and what I do, um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Buffalo. Um, for the last 15 years of my life, uh, my academic life, I've been working studying people. I've been studying some of the hardest things that's out there in science. Um, and people often think of the hard sciences as being hard. But really, if you think about the hard sciences, and this is, um, this is a quote uh, by Eugene Weiner, who was part of the Manhattan Project. And it's a very prescient statement where he says, you know, uh, the natural world operates very precisely. And once you figure it out, everything is engineering. The world I deal with, the world I have been dealing with, is the world a lot of people don't want to deal with. It's the world of people. People as employees, people as individuals who work in organizations, people who are CIOs, CSOs, people who work in security agencies, people who work for the government. And this is a hard world. It's a world in which they use technology all the time, it's a world in which technology is being thrown at them, where things are happening at, at a very immense speed. And it's a world where the bad guys are really good at the social science end of the business, the end of the business that a lot of people don't want to deal with. Because the bad guys out there figured out that, hey, you know, the old school ways, old school, right, hacking people, hacking technology, that's, that's engineering. People, on the other hand, are much more easier to compromise. And once you compromise people, you have access, essentially, you got the keys to the kingdom. And this is the reality we deal with. This is the reality I have been trying to deal with and grapple with and try to explain. And, and I have been fortunate enough to work uh, with government agencies, with companies, um, you know, write extensively about this, research this, this issue quite a bit. And, and the proverbial term everybody uses for this is the people problem. Okay? It's the people problem. And every one of you know what I'm talking about, right? The users are the problem. And we hear this repeatedly. There were some talks uh, yesterday where I was listening to the same, same, same proverb coming back over and over again. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this people problem. And this is a big problem, right? It's a growing problem. It's not going away. 20% um, of all major breaches are because of something people did. And this is only, I'm just accounting for breaches uh, that involve you know, hackers making entrances into, into networks. I'm not talking about people uh, you know, willingly giving up the inside of the problem. I'm not talking about that. So if you add those numbers, they add up very quickly. Uh, so almost one in five of all breaches are because of people today. Right? We got the engineering. We, didn't, we couldn't figure out the people. Um, it's getting worse. Right? This is the most recent 2015 Verizon DBIR. Three out of four of all attacks are spear phishing attacks. And you guys know this, right? The people in IT understand this problem. Um, and we know that the actors are everybody, right? The good thing about email is everybody uses it. The bad thing about email is anybody can use it. 
And with spear phishing today, anyone with very minimal skills can basically purchase software for malware for hire and basically spear fish people and get into networks. And it's very easy to do. And given that, everybody is doing it. Right? We have all become the weakest links. And we keep telling employees, you're the weakest link, you're the weakest link. Um, I've done a lot of work in this area. And I'm not going to go through all my work, but you know, it's quite a lot of publications. Uh, I've been working on this for a very long time now. I was one of the first people to start studying spear phishing in the social sciences when no one else was doing it. I also try a lot to draw attention to the people problem. So I've written quite a bit, uh, you know, a lot of opinion pieces on CNN. Uh, I've been writing and talking about this after every major attack, saying, hey, we haven't gotten this problem yet. You're looking at the wrong people. You've got to address the user problem here. Um, so my talk today is going to focus on some of the things that my research program, we've been working on this area, and I'll tell you what my research program does. What we do is we, we, we fish people, all right? We do this, we've been doing this for the past six years, uh, six to eight years, where we spear fish people via email, we spear fish people on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on every medium that we can find. Uh, we have done this in universities, we have done this in government institutions, installations, uh, we have done it uh, in organizations. And what we're trying to do after all of these is build an understanding of the why. We know people are falling for it, there's no question about it. But the why is something that we have been able to figure out. And a lot of my talk today is going to be talking about the why and how we can build that to address the problem of spear phishing. Okay? Uh, so my focus, the, my, the talk today, is going to talk about um, some of the approaches that people have been using right now, the, the IT security approaches to dealing with the people problem, how effective they are, what our research points to, and how we can use that understanding to improve security. So we're going to kind of building, we're going to complete that loop in terms of what our research uh, points to and how we can do this better. So right now, this people problem, right, there are three approaches that we've been using so far. This is regardless of which organization it is, it varies in the level of sophistication, but there's basically three things that we've been doing. The first approach has always been a control approach, right? We try to control what people get, right? This is, this is, a, this is an engineering solution. And there's a lot of money being thrown at this problem. Uh, every, you know, decent organization out there is expected to do this, is expected to have these firewalls in place, these, these engineering solutions. So this is one way we've been dealing with it. Uh, the second C in terms of dealing with the people problem has been to constrain people. Okay, so we have a control process, we have a constraining process. In the constraining process, you know, we have all these solutions, and I've been talking to various vendors here, we have these ideas of air gapping and, you know, uh, whitelisting and uh, restricting administrative privileges. Uh, and these are some approaches, and we're going to talk about how we deal with that as well. Um, and the question of effectiveness, you know, how effective is this? You know, there is a, my favorite uh, comic, uh, Dilbert has, um, you know, Dilbert goes to work and, and uh, the IT guy says, hey, security is more important uh, than usability. And what, what um, Dilbert does is he sneaks in a laptop. Okay? This is the reality of today's organizations. Uh, the more control we put on them, the more people find ways to circumvent it. Because after a certain point, the control, the security, gets in the way of usability, gets in the way of work, gets in the way of what people do. In other words, if you don't understand what people do and start putting controls on them, they're going to try to find a way around it. And this is something we're seeing a lot. The third C that we have followed is convincing people. And this is, there's a lot of this happening right now, right? Convincing people is through training. There's a lot of spear fish training, anti, you know, fishing training, preparedness training. Every organization has a checkbox where they're putting people through these, these massive training programs. And I've evaluated quite a few of them. Um, these trainings follow one of two patterns. One is, you know, you simulate some kind of fishing environment, you spear fish people, and then, you know, when they get fished, you tell them why they got fished. If they keep getting fished, you pull them out. Um, Admiral Rogers, the head of the NSA, uh, he said, hey, you know, we want to make them shape up, we can scare them into doing this, right? This is like the conveyor belt. You keep making people do, make mistakes, and every time they make mistakes, you tell them to shape up. 
okay? So this is another approach. So this is the training approach. And this training approach, these three Cs, is all we have right now that's directly addressing this people problem, okay? And the cost of this training, this is a, this is a, a RAND report, uh, the cost of this training is going up, and it's expected to rise faster than the cost of basically the, the, the loss from breaches themselves. So we have, what we're looking at in the near future is a, an increased cost of training, of air gapping, of doing all these things, which are going to exceed the cost of many of these breaches, the losses from these breaches. So we have to do something to make this training better, okay? Now, when we look at the effectiveness of these approaches, right, uh, most of these organizations, the training organizations, are for-profit entities, it's very hard to say, okay, how effective has this been? Now, I know this anecdotally. You guys probably know this. The people who have, the CSOs out here who have worked, you know, provided training or tested training. Training's effectiveness is very questionable. There's no question that there is some effectiveness, but how effective is it in the long term? We just don't have a grip on it because the statistics are not coming out. The one thing we do know is when we look at some of the statistics that are coming out, in terms of the time to compromise. The time to compromise, if anything, is going up a little bit. But it's very marginal. And the time to discovery, that is how quickly we discover a breach, has not gone down. It's remained more or less flat. Okay? So this is one indicator that you know, the so-called defender detection gap is not going down. So a lot of these three Cs are really not doing much in terms of bringing down or reducing the discovery gap. So we have a problem right there. The second indicator of the effectiveness of some of this is just looking at the academic research. So when we looked at the academic research going back you know, to the uh, to 2005 onwards, in 2005 some of the early studies looked at the effectiveness of training, and what they found is you know, within 24 hours, most of the people forgot the training, and they got fished at the same rate all over again. So if you did a simulated attack, you trained people, 24 hours later, you fished them again, you start seeing these people start getting fished again. So this is a problem. What's the long-term effectiveness? Um, we've looked at uh, Verizon's DBIR. 50% of the people are still opening spear phishing emails and clicking on it within the first hour. When I do simulated attacks, I get as high as 30 to 50% success rate. So a hyperlink in an email will give me a 30% success rate. Uh, I mean, a, a 40 to 50% success rate. If it's an attachment, it'll give me a 20 to 30% success rate. Attachments take a little longer because people have to do a little bit more to open it. So when we look at this data, this is a, a more recent study uh, by you know, a group of scholars uh, who are working at, at the Mitter Corporation. And what they found, and this is really interesting, they found that when you trained people repeatedly and you looked to see who these people were, they found three groups. Right? So most of your victims are three types. There are people who don't click on anything, which is about 22%, a minority of people, and they don't even open email. They just ignore a lot of emails. And that's one way to avoid getting fished. The second group is an all-clicker group. And the third group, and this is the most troubling, it's an inexplicable group. These are guys who you train, they'll get fished sometimes, then they'll again open it, they'll not get fished. The, the, the problem with this is we don't know what's going on. And that's a problem, right? When you're training people and you don't even know why these people are not responding to the training. So these guys went out and did what we did, which is ask people, why did you open this? And these are the kind of responses people gave. I had no idea. I clicked through many emails. I didn't know what I was doing. It all seemed very suspicious to me. Uh, I didn't think it was a big deal. And this is a problem. Oops, did I lose that feed? I lost the feed. I got spearfished. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have almost two-thirds of your sample that you're unable to explain, which becomes a, a big problem from an IT security standpoint where after you know, almost 10 years of doing this, we still don't have a grip on why people are doing these behaviors, okay? And 
The problem here is a problem of understanding people, and that's what our research points to. We can explain why. Are we up? No. Nope. Doesn't like me. All right. So, so anyways, I'm going to keep talking. So, two-thirds of your audience, two-thirds of your sample is getting trained. You're spending these training dollars, and you have no idea what they're going to do or whether your training is effective. And over and over again, the, the, the question that people tell me, the answer that people give me, we're back up. Yay. <laughs> we lost it. Are we back? There we go. You gonna hold it all the way? I'm gonna hang out here with you. <laughs> so, I'm gonna move to the next slide. doesn't like me. Do you want to do HDMI? Do you want to just Oh, you did. Okay. It's not a people problem. It's an engineering problem now. <laughs> I got this all wrong. Okay. Sure. I like company. So, I am here to say that and this is a bad slide to segue into this. It's not a people problem. It's an understanding of people problem. Okay, we haven't understood people. All right, and I'm gonna very quickly, because I'm running out of time, um, or not, I'm gonna very quickly talk about what we know about people and how we can build on that. All right, so let me once more tell you about how we build this understanding. We have built this understanding by studying people simulating phishing attacks and understanding and asking them, okay, why did you click on this? And we've done these studies now for the last eight years. And we have done cumulatively almost about 25 studies in various industries, in government. Uh, we have ongoing studies right now at banks, at city governments, and at universities. And what we did is we said, okay, across the board, what is it that explains why you clicked on an email and why I may have clicked on it. And there were different reasons. Okay? And what we did with that understanding is we developed a model, and it's just a published piece, which is called the Suspicion Cognition Automaticity Model, also called SCAM. I like that. It sounds. And the computer doesn't like it, but I do. So the SCAM model basically and I'm going to talk very briefly about this model, it basically explains using essentially what we found is there's just about five factors, five things in people that identify why they clicked on either a hyperlink or an attachment <laughs> and the extent to which it works. And all five are people factors. I never factored in the engineering problem, and so I'm facing it right now. Are we back up? No, we're not. So it's called the SCAM, the Suspicion Cognition Automaticity Model. All right? The Suspicion Cognition Automaticity Model. Suspicion Cognition Automaticity. And what we found is there's basically five factors. I'm going to explain this real briefly, but basically these five factors. What I mean by these five factors is you have suspicion, you have how people process information, what they believe in, and their habits. And once you can understand these five things, you can essentially predict, I can predict 60% of a person's likelihood, which in the social sciences is a lot of variance that I can explain, in their likelihood to get fall for a spear phishing attack, regardless of what type of attack it is. Okay? And that's the understanding that we're using to build better training to come up with better protocols, to come up with better administrative protocols. I'm going to talk real briefly about it um, before, the, uh, before my tech gets going here. All right. And so what we found is cognition is very important, understanding how people think. All right? And this is very critical. And what we find is, uh, you probably know this, people are cognitive misers. 
What does that mean? Uh, they don't use a lot of resources. They're constantly using shortcuts. And spearfishers understand this really well. Right? And the reason they understand this is because they're constantly sending these attacks out and they're getting the feedback and building on that. And they're saying, okay, here's what works, let's use that. And let me give you a quick example of this, right? Um, here are two attacks that we have used, right? The one on the left is one you see when you go to Starbucks in most of the country, right? This is Google's fiber that provides uh, Wi Fi access. And the one on the right is a spear phishing attack. Right? And the right, one on the right asks you for your Google login and password. And you'd be surprised at how successful that is. And the reason it's successful is because people are using a heuristic, it's Google or it's Starbucks. They're not paying attention to the nuances that tell you, hey, what's the, what's the quality of that graphic? And here's what happened, and you can see this right here. On the left is the anthem letter I got, and the right is the anthem spear phishing that we got. I don't know about you, but the spear phishing attack is way better. Right? And that thing came on November 5th. This thing came right away. And so that spearfisher, I give him you know, full marks on this one. Right? Because he just re-victimized everybody, 80 million people probably. So you see how heuristics work. Uh, the second thing is what people believe. And this is very critical. Right? No one's paying attention to this. None of our training pays attention to this. And this is a critical point. The point is um, when we go around asking people, hey, what is safer, a PDF document or a Word document? What do you think people tell us? What do you think? Yeah. Why? Because they did what we shouldn't be doing. I can't edit it, so the bad guy can't edit it. <laughs> so we make up these rules that have, are artificial rules that make absolutely no sense if you really sit down and talk to somebody, but they are the way we govern our behavior. And there's lots of them, and we have identified pretty much all of them. There's a lot more, but... And this is a very interesting phenomenon, and this phenomenon for those of you who are in the social sciences or interested, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Has anybody heard of this before? And, and, and the idea behind this is, is essentially this. There was a guy, not this guy, called MacArthur Wheeler in, in Pittsburgh, and he broke into two banks and held them up, and he put lemon juice on his face because he had heard that if you put lemon juice, you could use it for disappearing ink, so if you put lemon juice on your face, the video camera is not going to catch your feed. <laughs> and then when they called him and they asked him, why did you do this? He's like, I had lemon juice. How did you see me? <laughs> this is a problem, right? The problem is you think you know the answer, so you go with that idea. And your risk beliefs are very critical in determining how cavalier you are about opening things. If you think mobile devices are safer, you're going to open stuff on it. That's why those people in those questions are saying, hey, I had a mobile device. I used it. The third thing is habits, and no one has been talking about this. I've been writing about this now for 10 years. Device habits, what do, we, what do we do? We do things without thinking. Right now, most of you are switched into you know, looking at your devices, doing things online. We're constantly doing this. And what we find is it's easier to attack people when they're on a device. The success rate is lower, but the click-through rate is very high. And so devices matter, and as we look into the future, Devices are going to matter a lot more. As we go to bring your own devices, you go to mobile devices, always on devices, integrated inboxes. So what we find is when people are distracted, it's easier to make them, you know, take things from them. They're not paying attention. Right? So what we find is with using this idea, these three factors, we can predict how likely someone is to fall for different attacks. If you know your work patterns, if I know your habits, and I can measure all of this. I can measure your habits, I can measure the heuristics, I can measure your risk beliefs, and I can do this proactively when you come into an organization. I can do it with existing training. Much of our training right now does none of this. It doesn't address these individual problems. It's a boilerplate training. We presume everybody's suffering from the same disease. And what we're saying is we can index this, and we're working on exactly this part using a few of these factors, and you can't game this because you don't know the answers to these questions. We can develop what's called as a cyber risk index. A cyber risk index is a quantitative metric of your risk threshold. How likely are you to fall for a spear phishing attack of a certain kind? Not just that, all I need is 40 questions in a survey. And we've been able to do this. We're right now doing this in government. 
And we're using this index to say not only will you get fished, but why you will get fished. And the why is really important. It's not just enough saying you're going to get fished repeatedly and I can't explain it. Or yeah, you know what? Uh, people are curious. Yeah, whoop de doo. Why? Is everybody curious? So this is essentially what we're working on, an index of cyber hygiene. Just like a credit agency, we're able to come up with this, and this gives us an algorithm to work with. I know I'm out of time, so this gives us an algorithm to work with. And the algorithm is very simple. With each action, I can predict why you're going to fall for it, and I can come up with an intervention. So it's not one intervention that fits all, it's specific interventions based on what you have or don't have. So if habit is a problem, we have habit change that we can do. We can change your patterns of work. We can look to see what devices you're using, and we can constrain it to some extent. Our whitelisting might be different. If training is a problem, we don't train everybody in every which way, right? When we have car accidents, we don't train everybody in every which way. We train them based on what the problem is. So if heuristics are a problem, we'll give you better heuristics. If your risk beliefs are a problem, we're going to give you better risk beliefs. You're going to change those risk beliefs. And we have 60 years of social science that tells you how to change people's beliefs. So this, and I know I am out of time, so this in a sense is what, what we're working on. This works with existing training. So if you're using FishMe or any of these groups, we can work this with that. So we can give you an index, do your FishMe, and then we look at the index after and say, okay, here's what you need to address. So it works with what's there and makes it better. And I think that's the difference, right? Explaining the why rather than keeping on calling people the problem. All right? With that, uh, I think I'm out of time, so thank you, and um, thanks for the tech.